Welcome to Office Hours. Uh, if you are a repeat customer, that's great. It's uh, great to have you back. Uh, if you're new, uh, welcome. Uh, we're glad to have you. And if you don't know, Office Hours is a great collaboration between the Center for Civic Engagement, uh, the Oakland University Alumni Office, and the Office of Professional and Continuing Education here on campus. They've been great partners over the last couple of years. Uh, and we're really happy with the way Office Hours is developing. And what we try to do is uh, highlight OU faculty experts. And we've done that on uh, a wide range of issues uh, from politics to uh, relationships, from the economy uh, to um, race relations, right? So we've, we've really uh, had a big swath of uh, potential um, uh, discussion topics out there. And we look forward to continuing that. And we're going to do that today um, with uh, a look at COVID and mental health. And we have two wonderful faculty member experts uh, who are going to share their expertise with us today. Uh, we thought that this would be a good thing to do toward the end of the academic year, uh, given that just about a month ago, we passed into year three of the COVID-19 pandemic. And, and to even though, fingers crossed, we're, we're sort of coming out of it, we, we thought it would be a good idea to, to revisit and, and uh, talk about um, maybe some things that didn't get as much uh, attention during the last couple of years. So uh, we're very pleased to be joined uh, today by, as I said, two faculty experts, one from uh, the School of uh, uh, Education and Human Services, one from the School of Health Sciences. Uh, Dr. Rebecca Vanest is an assistant professor in the Department of Counseling at OU with specializations in child and adolescent counseling, play therapy, and school counseling. She has 14 years of experience as a high school, middle school, and elementary school counselor. Uh, she pre frequently presents in Michigan and nationally on mental health topics as an expert media guest in the Detroit area. Dr. Vanest has served on the Michigan School Counseling Association Board as an elementary vice president and the ethics board chair. She recently published an article in the Journal of Humanistic Counseling regarding school counselor influence in disrupting systemic racism in college attendance. Our other guest is uh, Terry Dibble. Uh, his professional career ex expands the health and fitness field. He's worked in, uh, in cardiac rehabilitation, corporate wellness, and physical rehabilitation. His years uh, early on were spent at OU in the Meadowbrook Health Enhancement Institute, and later at a variety of rehab centers with a focus on neck and back rehabilitation. While at the MBHEI, he developed the Smoking Cessation Program. Uh, he's participated in a research project on stress management, which, which was funded by the state of Michigan. And he was responsible for the worksite health screening program and presented on a variety of health topics to corporations and the community. We are uh, delighted to have Terry and Rebecca with us today. Uh, and with that, let's just jump right into uh, to some questions. And again, folks uh, in the audience, please feel free to uh, put a question in the chat, either with your name um, associated with it or not. Feel free to ask anonymously. So. Uh, Rebecca and Terry, can you can you talk a bit about some of the more silent aspects of the COVID-19 pandemic? For example, you know, we've we've heard reports recently uh, of uh, increased uh, domestic violence. We've heard about increased uh, suicide. We've heard about all these things that have, were happening while we were trying to deal uh, with a virus. So so what's your take on on um, some of some of those hidden costs of COVID-19? So I think we've uh, focused pretty substantially on the physical impact of COVID-19. We've heard a tremendous amount about the healthcare profession, hospitals being overrun. We've heard about what to do, wearing masks, screening ourselves, taking tests, getting vaccinated. Um, but there's all these other things, as you mentioned, that impact us as, as human beings. Um, so I think uh, this is a unique time in history where everyone we know and everyone they know is struggling with something, whether it's financially, whether it's their kids, whether it's a, a job change, 
Um, there's just been a tremendous, I think, silent toll. And due to the, some of the stigma we still have in the U.S. around talking about mental health um, and just the physical isolation we've experienced, I think a lot of people are suffering in silence or feeling uncomfortable about talking about some of these you know, hidden things that they're struggling with. And we're, we're lacking those natural socialization avenues that we normally have for reducing some of that stress. Oh, Terry, you're muted. I agree with Rebecca on all those points. I think one thing that I would add to that is this whole notion of loneliness, which is a problem before COVID, it was exacerbated as a result of COVID. People were isolated, even though they could communicate with people on their phone. Uh, it's still a huge uh, mental uh, issue with them if they can't communicate with people. And one of the other, you know, other factors that's involved in that is people that like to hug people, right? You know, I'm not, I'm not necessarily a hugger, but there are a lot of people out there that hug. And that was hard. It's hard for them to uh, not be able to do that. So that creates some uh, mental stress as well. The, the folks who are huggers, right? I mean, is, is that uh, just an extra hurdle that they have to, to deal with in, in not being able, in being uncomfortable, right? Because I think that, that this, the, the, whole, the whole pandemic, right, made us incredibly uncomfortable in so many different ways, right? And, and made us do things that, we weren't used to, or that we didn't want to, or 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 whatever. What's the what's the toll on people's psyche and and mental health when when they're put into into different uncomfortable situations like that? Well, I think it it creates some undue stress on them, and we're still dealing with it, even though it's better now. But I still think when you meet somebody, you're not sure what you can or can't do. Can I shake their hand? Can I give them a hug or whatever? So that that whole issue becomes uh, mentally stressful for people trying to figure out what, what are their boundaries, right? Those boundaries have changed. I think we're also seeing uh, just, you know, as we read the news or, or try to interact with each other again, we're kind of looking around like, what's going on? Why is everyone acting so weird? Why are we all so off? Why am I feeling so off? And I think some of it is exactly what you two have mentioned is we're completely renegotiating how to be social in society. And, you know, we don't want to offend anyone. We want to respect boundaries. And it's like, yeah, what do we do now when we see someone we used to shake hands? Maybe, maybe we don't want to do that anymore. So um, everyone's just unsure of what to do. We're seeing a tremendous increase in anxiety in people that have potentially never struggled with that before at a clinical level. And I think the prolonged time frame that we've been dealing with this, um, to some extent, you know, many of us handled this well right when it started, maybe the first couple of months, and then it's just gone on and on and on. And it's really um, exhausted people's resources. So that, that's really interesting that, right, the, the, the re-engagement with people socially. And uh, we, we can maybe joke about it from time to time when you run into somebody, right, if we're on campus and we run into somebody in the Oakland Center and, and we don't know whether we should shake hands, fist bump, do the elbow thing, right? But, but on, a, on a really pragmatic level, uh, just a, a story, uh, an experience just yesterday, I, I'm, I'm on a search committee here at, at the university and we had somebody come in uh, to meet with the search committee and nobody knew what to do. And, and I felt bad for this person because you know, they didn't know if they should shake our hands, if they, if they should move away, right? And, and, and so increased stress, right? In not just generally, but maybe in some of those specific situations that uh, are, are, have a sort of high leverage situation, right? I mean, somebody coming in for a job interview, that's the last thing they need is to be is to be more stressed, right? So right. any advice for, for those kinds of situations? Well, I think it's, it's a tough, especially walking in and you don't know the person, right? What, what to do. That's probably the most challenging. If you're going in for a job interview, do I shake their hand or don't I? You know, I had a doctor's visit about a year ago 
uh, I was just meeting this doctor for the first time and I stuck my hand out to, to shake his hand. He goes, we don't shake hands here, you know, which kind of put me back a little bit. I'm like, okay, that's fine. But you don't know, right? And how, I mean, unless you can find out ahead of time or just, just ask them, you know, do you shake hands? Are you a hugger? Or, I mean, being open about it and honest and not being judgmental about what, what they, what they're comfortable with, right? They may not want to shake hands because of the risk. So I think the biggest thing is being open and honest and being non-judgmental of other people about what they, how they want to live their life at this point in time. Jerry, I really like what you mentioned about being open and non-judgmental because I think we just all need an extra ounce of graciousness towards each other right now to give everyone else just that additional space and, and, you know, allow for more differences and, and respect those differences that we do have. And I think one of the ways we need to do this, which I think we're probably all struggling with right now, is we need to think more about fortifying ourselves and replenishing our own personal resources so that we can handle the stress. Because something like you described at the doctor's office that is so low on the list of something you should have to even be thinking about of just being a human being navigating society. That's such a minor task, but now that's become a major concern for all of us of like, when I see someone, what do we do? So I think we need to, you know, however we can, as best as we can be thinking about just replenishing our ourselves physically sleep and just anything we can do to show ourselves some extra kindness right now. Yeah, I think being kind to yourself is a big um, issue right now. And if, I mean, it didn't bother me that he didn't want to shake hands. It just kind of surprised me a little bit, but I got over it. But there are some people that have, would have a hard time with that. And we just got to learn how to let go of little things. I mean, these are small things, but over time they start to add up and it becomes a cumulative effect. Absolutely. That reminds me of that of that book from several years ago, right? Don't sweat the small stuff, right? Is that right? right. Um, we, we've got a question from the audience uh, from Aaron uh, who asks, keeping on the stress uh, stress path here, if you will. Um, as a parent, how does worrying about your your child's stress level compound your own? And, and we'll get more into kids later, I hope too. But um, you know, so she continues to ask, how do you help your kids cope while also helping yourself? Yeah, so I mean, that is the million dollar question right now. I think it's, uh, you know, parenting, you know, we kind of look at these, you know, socially and look at different generations. I don't think it's out of line to say parenting has become more complex with this generation through, you know, the changes we've had just catastrophic changes with, you know, the internet, and then you add in, you know, we've always had changes, but there's just some real uniquenesses. Um, to this particular, you know, the global nature of this pandemic, um, you know, the fact that we're sort of connected through our phones, but not really socially. And I think one thing we just need to accept is that parenting is really hard right now. And so to give ourselves some grace, and I think it's completely okay to be honest with your kids and to be transparent with them that everyone's struggling right now we are a team and we've really got to support each other right now, even though it's very hard. I think it's important to apologize when we make mistakes because we're shorter with each other, we're more stressed out. Um, one thing I do think can get into the realm of, of harm is all of us are consuming a lot of media right now and kids can't process that. Um, even teenagers, there's just, it's almost like trauma porn right now. It's just, there's so many bad things happening in the world. So I think, you know, as caregivers being aware of how much we just have the radio or the TV on in the background, and we're just, you know, that can really take a toll on our kids, how much of that they're consuming. And I think just having um, open conversations without going into the endless venting, we need to keep protect them from venting, but to have open conversations. So, so that raises as an, an raises an interesting point for for somebody who has teenagers, right? I mean, and and I'm I'm an old guy, right? So I don't, I, I and I don't, I'm not a social media guy, right? But they are, and 
TikTok. I mean, that's all they do. And 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 so you know, how can you talk to them about? Um, and we're maybe getting a little far afield here, which I'm famous for in my classes. So this is just like, you know, PS 1100. Um, you know, how do we talk to them about information that they receive via social media, right? And another topic that we've had in office hours, but but this really sort of uh, connects with, with stress levels and the question that Aaron asked, right? I mean, that is a, uh, uh, for some of us, right, an, an unknown and something that, that we all struggle with. Yeah, I think the the whole social media thing is really blown up because of the COVID. And there's a lot of bad stuff out there. And I think, as Rebecca said, you got to be honest with your kids. Sit down and explain to them, you know, because they may get something in social media that they won't tell you about right? That's bad and hurt them, but they may not let, you know, reveal that information. But I think letting them know that, uh, you know, whatever happens, you're there for them. I think one of the things too, is that the parent has to uh, show calmness, right? They, it probably the analogy that I like to use is the, think of a duck on the water, right? He's, the duck is sailing along, but underneath he's paddling like crazy in there. So I think if you, you get stressed about something to help your kids, you got to present yourself in a calm way. And, and I think that helps because if you're stressed, your kids know you're stressed. It really transfers over. You know, with social media, I think our tendency is to want to ban things as parents or to say like, well, you just got to get rid of TikTok. But, um, you know, these things are here to stay. And so I think it's about talking with our kids about how to be a responsible consumer. And I think one of the things that's so scary about social media is um, we bring a lot of ourselves to it. You know, things like TikTok have algorithms. And so each thing we're clicking and liking starts to become a, a loop of reflection of ourselves. And so I think, you know, I can only imagine, you know, as kids grow up, this is going to be more intense, what's out there and what's available. And we need to, I think, empower our kids to be respectful consumers and to realize there's instant consequences. We like something, we post something, we fire off a comment. Maybe we'd never do that in real life, but um, you know, this is here to stay and we need to just think about what we bring to it and how we can be responsible and use it in a healthy way rather than going down these negative traps. So let's, let's switch gears just a little bit and, and talk a, about folks who may not have struggled with, with mental health issues previously, um, but Maybe, maybe they were exposed in, in COVID and uh, it's new to them, right? I mean, so, and, and what is, can you talk a little bit about, about those folks and what you're seeing in, in, in that segment of the population, right? I mean, how many more people maybe are, are struggling with mental health now than, they, than pre-COVID? I mean, what was the increase um, of problems? What areas were those problems uh, uh, highlighted what's going on well i think the uh the college age students we're seeing a significant increase probably 20 25 percent increase in mental health issues related to them um and a lot of it evolves around social media but a lot of it evolves around the fact that they can't socialize like they used to right they can't well i think we're getting back to it but they can't have parties and all these fun things that they used to do because uh, because of the rules that are in place out there. Um, we're a social being. We need to socialize with people and not not through our phones, but face to face. And I think that's part of it. And that early, so the there may be some underlying things that are going on, and this just kind of put them over the top with what's happening in the with mental uh, mental health? So I don't have any firm uh, statistics in regard to just globally what's happening to all of us, but I, I think um, without question, anecdotally, um, when I talk to practitioners that are currently working in the field, when people talk to me, when I consider my students, um, 
there's just a huge uptick in people who have never before strongly struggled with their mental health or maybe felt like they'd reached some equilibrium that are now just completely maxed out due to what's going on. And so I think one thing is just normalizing, like we are human beings who have been through undue amount of stress for a prolonged period of time. And I think it's really important, like Terry said earlier, not to judge ourselves and just to realize this is normal right now. It's okay to be struggling more than you have in a long time. Um, what I can say that I do have statistics on is, uh, you know, it's not fun to discuss, but uh, the suicide rates are extremely high right now. Um, for the age group of 10 to 24, it's the second leading cause of death. And that's not to include the folks that are just struggling um, in that area as well. So it's, it's very serious and it, it's something we need to look at. That's a shocking uh, statistic to hear, uh, honestly, that and and we we don't hear much about that and in sort of general news uh, consumption. And, and maybe to your point, Rebecca, from before that there's so much happening right in the world that uh, maybe that falls falls down the, the list of priorities for the press, which which is uh, another question in and of itself. So those are the that's that's suicide for the the novice right the the lay person is the end of the road uh, right in figurative figuratively and literally but what leads to that is have we seen increases in anxiety among people is it depression you know what are the what are the uh, where are people struggling the most maybe and anecdotally is fine too if that's if that's what we're where we're at well i think both those david uh depression anxiety follow suicide rates and both of those areas are increased at this time and it comes about because that they don't know how to handle they don't they don't have the coping skills that they need to figure out what's going to help them right there's some basic things that people can do but um they don't know what's available to them i guess but they do follow the depression anxiety does follow suicide rates and there are certain characteristics of people that are suicidal that like hopelessness is one of them. Now think about um, what's happened and you're sitting in your house all by, and you can't talk to anybody or, you know, whatever case might be, you're going to feel pretty hopeless at that time. And that's going to exacerbate some of the thoughts and suicide is about um, not necessarily about dying, but it's about ending the pain that that person's experiencing. And, the only logical reason that they can see to end it is by taking their own life. So there are help, there are methods out there to, to help individuals, but that's the other part of the problem. There's probably, you know, I said 20, 25%. That's, there's probably a lot of people that are unknown that are struggling right now because they won't tell people about it. And is that more than, than normal? Terry, that 20 to 25 percent has that also grown the, the, the yeah yeah that's who, gone up won't talk about it yeah so with suicide we tend to uh, divide it into three categories of suicidal ideation gestures and attempts so ideation is just you're thinking about it you're um, sometimes it's in an anxiety loop that the thoughts are kind of intrusive and you um, exactly what Terry said. It's about um, pain avoidance and maybe not having other coping skills. And then we see a lot of young people engaging in things like cutting, um, which there's actually an incredible dopamine release um, when that occurs, um, which you can also get through um, a cold shower, surprisingly. So, um, and then, you know, we see the attempts where it's getting, you know, escalating in seriousness. But, um, it, there's so many incredibly simple things to do uh, just to get into mental health care, to increase your coping skills. But I think this is another area where the complexity of parenting has skyrocketed and people are just feeling like, oh my gosh, do, you know, am I being an alarmist? Is my kid okay? Should I take action? And it's, it's hard for parents to differentiate. So I, let's, uh, I wanted to talk about this at the, at maybe later, but since you've both mentioned tactics, right? But so what are some things that, that 
some practical things folks can do to to get help if they're if they're not feeling like they think they should, right? If if they if they uh, f- find themselves just being maybe off, and, and where can they go? What can they do? Go ahead, Rebecca. You want to? So I've been doing this a very long time and have worked with lots of people who are feeling suicidal or making attempts. And um, it's incredible when I talk to people, typically they do not have basic coping skills. So really anything that you like to do, um, make a music playlist, take a bath, go for a walk, watch a movie. Like a lot of people um, go to zero from zero to 10 very quickly. So what we need is those incremental coping skills. If you are stressed out and not coping well, we need layers of intervention in there. So people need to have a plan before they get into crisis about what they can do to cope. They need daily self-care. And then if they're in a crisis point or even before they get to that crisis point, they need to seek out therapy. And it's very, very treatable um, if you are seeking treatment. Yeah, I I definitely agree with that. I think... um... The early intervention is a key part of this whole thing is if we can have them doing things before they get to that level. Uh, and, and they're very simple things. I, those of you that may know who I am, I used to teach a laughter class and laughter is a big uh, intervention that can be beneficial. And we talked a little bit about social media earlier and there's a lot of funny stuff on social media. Um, so I will go on there and when I feel like I need to get a laugh and watch some of the silly things that go on in this world, Uh, but exercise, meditation, uh, Rebecca mentioned self-care. These are very simple things that people can do. And it really depends on what, what's driving the challenge at that point. You know, is it, maybe they got a bad grade on an exam and that really frustrated them or something, some trauma happened in their life. So it really depends on what the situation is with that individual and how far down the road they've gone in terms of uh, mental health issues. So I have two follow-ups to that. Um, and the, the second one is, is I, w- I want to talk, uh, I want Terry to talk a bit more about that uh, humor work. Cause I think that that's just fascinating stuff. Uh, but the, you both really mentioned very simple things, and, and I think that that again from the from the layperson, right? When we hear you know somebody struggling with mental health, I, I think we make assumptions, or some people may make assumptions about what a uh, what that path to getting better is like. And and from what I what I'm hearing from you both is that well, you you might be able to to make a a, a difference by just doing normal things that that you that that give you joy that give you right. peace right that so it, it's not automatically and i'm not, maybe this is not what you meant rebecca when you said one to ten immediately but it's how what i heard which was sort of okay i'm not feeling well i might have some some mental health struggles i need to uh get on medication i need to go to uh you know therapy right which may be the case but what i heard is that you know there might be some intermediate steps that you can get some some relief right away. Absolutely, and like Terry said, uh, I would say 99%, if not higher, of the people I've worked with struggling around this issue, they just want their pain to end, and they're they're kind of at a loss as to how to make that happen. And so, um, you know, they've almost forgotten their ability to cope and their ability to find joy in all the little things in life. So when they get to a, you know, extreme point, we definitely want people to seek mental health care. Um, But there's so many things um, just by developing, you know, considering what you enjoy doing, getting out and exercising, um, calling a friend, like there's so many things we can do that we just don't reach for um, that are simple and free. Uh, There's tremendous mindfulness apps and things available on the internet where you can help yourself go to sleep with guided meditation. You can listen to a five minute mindfulness app. And um, these are simple things that can reduce stress. Yeah, I teach. Sorry, go ahead. 
Yeah, I teach a stress management class too. And so when I introduce meditation, a lot of the students are like, that's weird stuff, but it really is not. It's very simple. And I tend to avoid using meditation, but if you just take five minutes of quiet time, just sit down in the middle of the day and relax. A lot of people think they got to be going, going, going all the time. And that's part of what what's happened is they can't go anymore because where we have all these rules that we have to follow now. So it changes how you have to, you're behaving, which can be stressful in and of itself. I, I do want to come back to the laughter piece, Terry, but we've got a, a, a question from the audience that I want to get to uh, right, right away. Um, and it's uh, somebody asked anonymously, but uh, this person asks, do you have advice for encouraging my 20 year old who does not live with me to seek therapy? Insurance will cover it, but he isn't following up with finding a provider or making an appointment, even though he says he will or wants to. So that's a tough one for sure. Um, what I will say is like many things, um, I'll compare it to going to the dentist. If we go you know, every six months or early on and we're having constant checkups, it's a great experience if we wait you know, five or 10 years past when we felt like we were really in crisis, it's much harder to solve. So I think, um, you know, being a supportive parent, uh, checking in with them, and um, I think being non judgmental can help as well. When our kids feel that intensity from us or that pressure, um, it's this distance or pursuer relationship where we come close and they want to distance and we come close. So allowing a little interplay realizing they are adults and thinking about respecting their autonomy and then just doing some check-ins and some encouragement. So in a non-judgmental way, they know we're here for them um, whenever they decide to get help. Yeah, I, I, that's definitely on, on spot on. I think also not knowing what the relationship is between the parent and the child is a big factor too. Maybe they can say, well, how about if I go with you? You know, they offer some support in that way, if that's even possible for them to participate with them. There's a big stigma about mental health, especially in college age students, that they don't wanna be identified as having some mental health issue. But there are a lot of people that go to counseling just to go because it makes them feel better. Um, so that's what we're trying, that's what we're struggling with is getting over this idea that, you know, I really, I don't wanna go to counseling because then I'm gonna be labeled in some way and that's not true at all. So, so, and that brings up another point that I wanted to get to, which is uh, terrific, right? But, and, and it gets at a, maybe a silver lining of COVID, right? I mean, and, and if we're being honest about it, there are, there have been some of those, you know, yeah. I, I mean, n none of us would, would trade those for, you know, the, the, the last two years to, to, to go away. But, um, you know, as, you know, has there been more of a light on mental health problems in the last two years? Are, are people, is it starting to be destigmatized more so than prior? You know, is, is, there, is there some benefit to um, what we've all had to experience in the last couple of years? Yeah. I, I think um, COVID has given us permission to talk about it more, right? I think, you know, and we're seeing it in the schools and um, in at the college level, there's more discussion about it. There's people out there realize that as administrators or leaders that we can do something to help our, our, our employees, our students, whatever it is. So that discussion is starting to continue to go up, I believe. I agree wholeheartedly. I think we've got a long way to go, but I think there's been... Um, just the raising of awareness, um, a, a greater awareness of childhood mental health struggles, adolescent mental health struggles, we're all, it's on our radar now. And I think um, the best thing that each of us can do individually is to suspend judgment of ourselves and others. And in those little interactions, even in our own mental thought processes to destigmatize the conversation in our own mind. So instead of you know, if you hear about someone's child struggling or you're struggling or a coworker's struggling, instead of 
silently judging them or like glad it's not me. We just need to destigmatize the conversation. Um, and it, it's so obvious now, it just seems almost laughable to not understand that we could be struggling with mental health right now. So I hope we all um, use this to take a giant step forward. Uh, I, Dave, I also think that the discussion has changed where it's not just me, it's the community supporting mm -hmm. the idea that we can help other people in our community to do whatever needs to be done uh, to get, get that person healthy. Well, that, you know, and, and that's a positive, right? That's a, a, any little bit that we can chip away at that, at that stigma and, and to make people more comfortable seeking help is, is great, right? And uh, let, now let's get back to that, to the, what I was uh, talking about before, right? T Terry, talk to us a bit about the, the impact of laughter on, on stress and, and uh, overall mental health. Well, I think um, laughter is a, is a great intervention, right? An intervention is something that we employ to change something, right? So if you're, uh, depressed or you're anxious or whatever you're feeling, then you do this intervention of laughter, however you want to get that laughter. The research is much better now that we have functional MRIs, we can really see changes in the brain as a result of laughing. And, and really, it's kind of like exercise in and of itself. It has the same impact that exercise does. So it, it helps uh, the brain, it helps the, the body, uh, and physically changes things. It helps your interactions with other people. Uh, it reduces uh, adversity uh, in a lot of situations. So there's a lot of benefit to laughter. And I, like I said, I go on social media and things are funny, but to me, the, a lot of things are funny, right? I'll drive down the road and I'm laughing at things, you know, car license plates or, you know, different things. Um, get me to laugh. And I think that's part of a benefit. You know, it helps to ease the stress. There's been some stressful situations that I've been in that um, laughter kind of ease those situations. That's interesting, right? So as a political scientist uh, who studies campaigns, I, I actually see a connection between these two worlds, right? Because we often see during campaign season. So folks, you know, that we're getting into that now. So it, that over the next six months, watch out for this because it'll be there. But um, campaigns will often use humor to go after their opponent. And right. it's done because it it takes a bit of an edge off of the, the quote unquote negativity, right? And yeah. and I think it, people are more accepting of that information when they when they can laugh about it. And, and I, you know, I, I think that, there's some similar themes that that are connected there, which is, I think, um, you know, a, a great example of how different disciplines can find commonalities, right? And and that's uh, that's just interesting to me as a social scientist. So yeah, uh, um, I think also but, if you look at commercials today, a lot of them use humor in some way. A lot of them not very good, but uh, <laughs> they use humor in, in selling because they know that if somebody's in a happy mood, they're going to be more open and receptive to the information that they're giving out. Do they remember it more? Is, does that help people remember information? In some respects, but not, I don't think, it's not going to make that person get up and go buy a car or, or, or health or insurance, car insurance. <laughs> the little guy, little funny little guy, whatever he is. The gecko. Not to mention any, <laughs> any names. <laughs> We're not endorsing any insurance yeah. companies, folks. That's right. Right. Um, let's switch gears and, and talk about the the overall outlook on mental health in Michigan. Uh, sort of where are we as a state? Uh, there, there have been some changes in in maybe policy recently and um, maybe overall direction, sort of where are we and, and what are some of the barriers for people who, who might be seeking treatment? So we have some wonderful, wonderful professionals in a variety of disciplines across the state, you know, school counselors, mental health counselors, social workers, psychologists. But what we have in Michigan, unfortunately, is an extremely fractured system. Um, if you have a child with a, a health care issue or, you know, say asthma, 
we have all sorts of parents we can talk to. There's very clear protocols on how to handle that. And when you have um, a child or when you yourself are struggling with mental health, um, there's kind of a disconnect. So if you seek out a therapist, a lot of times they have um, pretty robust waiting lists right now. It could take, you know, eight weeks to get into a therapist. Um, well, what if you're in active crisis? What if your child's suicidal? Well, um, one of our only options for that is going to the emergency room where they're there to actively save lives. For instance, if someone has made a suicide attempt, they are there to save your life. So if you're, say, just talking about suicide, they're kind of like perplexed as to what to do or how to handle it. And then we have sort of an in-between, which is inpatient mental health systems uh, where someone might be there overnight or just during the day, they need a lot of extra support that their family can't provide. And those uh, organizations are often very overrun or do not have adequate beds to house everyone. So I think families are in a position of sort of ping-ponging through the system and not always knowing how to accurately get care for their child. Yeah, I one of the things I wanted to add to that is that there's a you know a disparity in mental health in, in our state, particularly in uh, low income areas. Uh, they just number one, they don't have the counseling services available. Number two, they don't have the money or the health insurance to get them into a program. And I think that's needs to have more focus on it. And there's also a racial and cultural element here where we have less representation of all types of people in the field of counseling. So someone might be in a position where uh, maybe mental health is very stigmatized from their cultural background and they'd, it'd be very helpful to go to someone who looks like them or sounds like them. And we do have some shortages in the field of needing to attract more you know, diversity in the people we're training. So um, we've got a lot of work to do, but I also, um, you know, think it's exciting that we can all team up and tackle this problem. So that, that gets at a question that I, occurred to me, Rebecca. The, uh, we hear all the time, and rightly so, about shortages in uh, teachers, uh, nurses, et cetera, right? So do we have other short, what, what, are the, what are the mental health, you know, occupational areas where there are shortages? Yeah, so I'll speak to specifically something I know very, very well, which is school counseling. So right now, Michigan has the third worst ratios in the nation. So that means, uh, for instance, when I was a school counselor, I was personally overseeing between 350 and 950 students by myself. So one thing we need is additional funding, which uh, the governor recently allocated $240 million to add school counselors, social workers, and nurses into our school system. However, we're conversely having a shortage of students going into the field. So we, uh, they had money, which is historic. This is the first time in at least 15 or 20 years we've had any sort of historic financial investment into our infrastructure in this way. Um, and school districts were finding they couldn't, they didn't have the people to hire, which is a big pendulum swing over the last 10 or 15 years. If, if there are folks that are interested in, in, in getting into that field, what are, what are some of the things they can and, and or should study? Yes. Yeah, so um, it's, it may be dissimilar to other fields, but to get into mental health, you do not have to have a bachelor that was specifically in that area. You can have a, a different bachelor's degree. So really, uh, someone with a bachelor's degree can seek out a mental health um, field. We have a variety of options here at Oakland. Um, we have a new social work program starting um, in the Department of Counseling. Um, we're one of the only universities in the state with where you can get a doctorate in counseling. Um, we have a school counseling program. Um, we have a psychology program here. So one thing I would just mention to folks that are interested in this is if you feel like, oh gosh, I didn't take the right things in undergrad, that's okay. We, we really encourage people from a variety of fields to um, come in and add that master's degree. So Terry, uh, Ruby in the Q&A wants to know, um, well, she says, uh, you said you used to teach laughter classes. Do you know anyone who's teaching it currently? 
and yeah, where? there we we have we offer still offer the class on camp in the School of Health Sciences. That's so great. If they look in the Health Sciences uh, curriculum, they'll find uh, there's two two uh, instructors teaching that class now. So I, I don't I don't know if Ruby's a student or a community member, but uh, if they're a community member, maybe we can uh, maybe you can audit the class. I, I I've got somebody. Yeah, that's uh, possible. Yeah. Somebody in the from the community auditing auditing my PS eleven hundred class this semester. Yeah. It's a, yeah. a great addition. Um, let's see. Uh, we've got just a few minutes left. Let's see. Um, you know, one of the one of the not fun parts about this is to talk about bad outcomes. Right. So and and one of the thing I, I know that we've got a slide for the end that that will give folks and, and we'll send out all of this to uh, everybody who, who's here today. But but Rebecca and Terry, can you talk about some resources that might be available to folks should they feel that they need it or they want to supply it to a friend or a family member of theirs? Yes, so an incredible leap forward that we're making nationally is we are moving our suicide hotline number from a very long, impossible to memorize convoluted number to a national 988 number, and that begins uh, July. And so this is going to be very similar to 911. It's easy to remember. So if someone is in crisis, if you uh, know of someone else in crisis, this is something they can call 24 hours a day at an unlimited basis. It's completely free. And you can get help if you're in crisis, if it's the middle of the night, you call 988 starting in July and you can get immediately connected to help. Yeah, also we have on campus, the Graham Health Center has a counseling center um, available to students, faculty and staff. I think the uh, students get six free sessions and then it's like $12 a session after that. Um, and they, <clears throat> one of the, complaints in the past has been that they they has a long, long waiting list for them but they've gone out and connected to like 30 different uh, facilities in the community so that people can get help as quickly as possible then we have the counseling uh, program where they will see people for free you don't even have to be part of the university you can just make an appointment and and these are uh, the PhD students that are being monitored by the faculty. So that's that's an opportunity on campus. And then we have uh, Common Ground out in the community, Havenwick. These are all, I think Common Ground is uh, based on income. So if people have can't afford or they don't have insurance, you know, those are those facilities too. And uh, something that's not very well known is we also have a mobile crisis unit in the county through Common Ground. So, you know, sometimes situations are very complex. People don't have transportation or finances, and they will actually go on site to the person. They will go on site and help a family and help them sort through, do I have insurance? What is out there? How do I make the phone call? And they'll make the connections. And then one more thing I'd like to mention is uh, just like uh, with, I mentioned the dentist earlier, uh, I think it's just something we should all have in our repertoire of doctors. So if you are feeling that your child is in crisis, if you are in crisis, if a loved one is in crisis, reach out before it gets extreme. There's absolutely nothing wrong with um, having this just be part of your annual, you know, you have a therapist, you have a dentist, you have a, a medical doctor, and just getting someone, um, and like the parent that was talking about their child that's a, now an adult, you know, if we build in some of those things, like when our kids are in high school, we have like a family therapist or a contact, you know, when they go to college, that's sort of a home base for them as well that they can return to. Um, so I think um, if we can be proactive when we can, it's great to just get that contact in your family medical system. All wonderful advice. Uh, Rebecca, Terry, uh, thank you so much. I can't believe the hour just flew by like it did. We could, we could talk about this either fortunately or unfortunately for, for several more hours, right? But uh, mm -hmm. we wanna be respectful of your time, of the, of the audience's time. 
we've got just a, a, a few more minutes and we're gonna, I'm gonna kick it back to Amy uh, for some closing thoughts, uh, but just a, a big thank you from, from me personally, from the Center for Civic Engagement, the uh, office, the uh, alumni office at OU and the uh, Office of Professional and Continuing Education. Thanks to you both for a, a wonderful office hour session and um, I'll kick it back to Amy. All right, yeah, thank you both so much. So to go along with what Dave was saying, we have um, some additional resources that you know they just mentioned. We will be emailing these out in our follow-up email along with the recording of the session. So no need to write everything down, um, but these are some of the things that I know um, Rebecca just mentioned. They're switching over the new 988 number, uh, things of that nature. So we will send that out with the recording in the next week. And again, this is a collaboration between the Center of Civic Engagement, of course, uh, my office, Professional and Continuing Education, and the OU Alumni Association. And thank you so much for joining us. We hope to see you next season. Have a good afternoon.